So we have Oshin, and when we were discussing this, it was like it, it seemed impossible to um, to have this meeting without um, kind of tipping a hat towards mono depth. Um, now I have no idea what you're going to talk about. But I'm going to talk about mono depth. <laughs> well, well predicted. But um, well, obviously you were part of that team, so oh. um, so we're very happy that you came down from uh, Edinburgh to to talk on uh, digging into monocular mon I can't say monocular <laughs> depth. Yeah, and I guess in the context of the, of the event today, it should be a monocular depth estimation for computer vision. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for inviting me down. It's been really enjoyable to be here today. Um, yeah, so I, uh, you know, this is not just work obviously done by me. This is part of a team. So this is Clement Goddard, who's now at Skydio, was one of the main, was the first author uh, on some of the papers I'm talking about, but also uh, Michael Furman and Gabriel Brasto at uh, Niantech. Yeah, so about, I guess it was three years ago at this point, we started asking ourselves this question, um, can we train a deep network to predict depth from a, from a single image? Um, is this not working? Sorry, no. I'll do this. Okay, and so the, the setup is, yeah, we want to take an image as input. We have some deep network that we're going to somehow parameterize and train, and it's going to output uh, a depth map. And so, just because I'll show a lot of these today, um, these images, uh, in terms of how we're coloring them, darker pixels are further away and uh, near pix uh, brighter pixels are predicted to be uh, closer. Uh, yeah, and I'm not going to talk about interpretable models, we just have some deep network. For people that know about convolutional neural networks, there's nothing necessarily particularly special about the architectures that we're going to use. We have some kind of notion of decoder, uh, and an encoder and a decoder. And really, it's about the losses. That's what makes all of this work. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, really kind of following on from what, from what Will was saying and said so well, you know, there's many reasons why you might want to actually have depth. So photo editing is one of them. We can start doing things like relighting. This is an example from, from Niantech. So augmented reality is another application. So if you look at the video on the left, you'll notice that the little Pikachu is running around, but he's just pasted onto the video, okay? So it looks kind of artificial because there's no notion of uh, occlusion or it running behind something. If we're able to reason about depth and maybe some kind of notion of layers or occlusions, when this little guy runs around, he's now actually uh, running behind things that you might perceive to be behind him rather than uh, actually being stuck in front of them. <coughs> Okay, and just in general, perception is another uh, situation where depth is really valuable. A lot of the uh, other uh, successes in vision in, in the last few years have been helped by things like these structured light or depth cameras. So if people are familiar with uh, connect body pose estimation, um, you were able to do things like pose estimation of hands, bodies, and so on by utilizing depth as an extra source of information. Okay, so... Uh, this is really uh, very well motivated, I think, by Lourdes and, uh, and Will previously. You know, we could learn from supervision. Again, we have our image. This is going to be our little network here, and the goal is to, for it to spit out some uh, depth map. If we had the supervised depth, you know, we'd use some loss. Maybe it's a squared loss, or, or you, you know, you choose whatever works for you, um, and we're done. But the problem is, and I think you should uh, hopefully believe it at this point, if three people have said it, that uh, it's hard to get uh, ground truth depth supervision. You know, there's different sources of data. It might be these uh, uh, cheap structured light sensors or laser scanners or lidars and so on, but they inherently have each of them their own limitations. So they have limitations in the kind of scenes that you can actually image. So if you start going into outdoor scenarios, you have interference from sun. Um, some of these sensors only give kind of sparse uh, depth uh, back as opposed to really depth, dense depth for every pixel. Um, shiny or moving surfaces are going to be uh, problematic. And they're also heavy and expensive devices. Um, and maybe kind of crucially for the computer vision community, right now there's, there's no just huge online repositories of this kind of information or data available. So, okay, that's, that's out. Um, and I probably should then refine the question that we asked at the start. So instead of how can we predict depth from a single image, it's really how do we train these models without depth supervision explicitly. Um, okay, and so in the first kind of uh, work we did in the space, the thing we assumed we did have access to was um, pairs of stereo images. And I, uh, and I realized one thing, so earlier on we saw a lot of eyeballs and I realized I must be computer vision because I've replaced them with, with cameras. Um, but uh, taking cues from basically binocular vision, um, 
the notion being, you know, uh, we, if we could estimate this disparity, we have basically the depth first, we have the scale inverse depth. Um, and so this is not a, we were not necessarily the first to make this observation, there's another paper from Ian Reed, Reed's group uh, around the same time, but the, the central idea was to use stereo information, so stereo images as a source of supervision to be able to then train networks to estimate depth. And today I'm not necessarily going to really go into the details and kind of the main, I suppose, motivation of my talk is to give maybe a bit of a flavour of how some of these things work, but also at the end I want to spend some time um, kind of showing where we're at and highlighting some of the limitations of, uh, of these kind of um, current computer vision models for depth estimation. But yeah, so the, the, the main motivation here is if we could predict the correct uh, depth, or let's say disparity in the context of our stereo for this particular input frame, we should be able to reconstruct the uh, other other image or the other view in this situation okay so in some sense we have some and we, we have some knowledge here which is we know the relationships between the two cameras so we treat this as an image reconstruction problem uh, this is our loss basically we're trying to synthesize an, uh, an, the other view by sample uh, by, by generating a, a, pr a prediction of it and you can imagine then what's happening to our network as it's training it's basically updating it's as it's training it's learning a better uh, estimate of the particular depth so that the reconstruction looks more like the actual input and i don't know if you can see it from down the back but kind of the visualization here shows that as this gets refined over time we get a closer match to it so this is the loss basically that's driving the parameterization of this network here that we're trying to train yeah, and so, you know, in some sense we were pretty happy with ourselves when, that, uh, when we got that working because it did actually work quite well and I'll show some results later on. But, you know, we've kicked the can slightly down the road because we've removed the need for depth, explicit depth of supervision and we said we can use stereo images. But, again, there's not really large repositories of this kind of stereo data available to us. You can certainly go collect it, but it's not out there. What is out there is huge amounts of monocular video, or certainly very easy to capture. You know, we could all take our phones and walk around and just take videos of, of the world, or go on YouTube and download them. Um, and so this was an observation, uh, maybe I should have said, so Richard kind of pointed out, so that, that previous work was called Mono Depth, and so building on that, um, and sl slightly afterwards, there was a paper that came out that took the Mono Depth concept, so this idea of doing um, reconstruction as a, as, a, as a loss for training depth networks, and they um, generalized it to the context of monocular videos. So what do we have in monocular videos? We basically lose one, cru uh, one crucial piece of information, which is we know this fixed relationships between the cameras. So now we've got to have some way of predicting what that, what that, what that will be. We also have another big uh, change, which is we now no longer can assume that the world is static because we're not imaging it at the same point in time. But uh, in terms of where we're at right now with these types of models, for all intents and purposes, they're basically assuming some notion of a static world. And all the uh, motion that's induced is as a result of this ego motion of the camera as it, as it moves around. But basically, same principle. We're uh, online now we're basically up, uh, we're predicting some relative pose between pairs of frames over time and the depth at the same time but now also we have access to sequences of frames before and after the particular um, input frame so we can use those as a source of supervision for training our models yeah and uh, just uh, more of a detail but this uh, what this results in we have this extra component like I mentioned which is this need to predict the the relative pose and um, and you could think of that as basically another neural network. So we have a network that takes some sequence of images, for example, two images as input, and it tries to predict the relative transformation between those in whatever representation works for you. Okay, so here's kind of where we were at uh, with MonoDepth in 2017. This was the stereo training. So again, this was the uh, visualization that I kind of talked about before. So brighter colors mean that the model thinks that those pixels are closer, and darker colors mean that it's further away. This is what happened um, when Zoo et al. <coughs> generalized the model to enable it to train on monocular sequences, but th they took a hit in terms of the actual quality of the predictions. Um, and then our most recent work, we've managed to basically recover a lot of the accuracy that was lost there. Lost there. Um, and so you can see even now, though we're only training on these monocular video sequences, we're still getting actually quite nice reconstructions, or predictions, I should say, rather. Yeah, so I will spend a few minutes kind of just highlighting uh, some of the things that uh, we did in that paper to, to make that work. 
Um, okay, so one of the big issues you have with monocular video is occlusion. So as the camera moves around the world, certain objects are going to become occluded and some will become disoccluded. So for example, if you watch the car, you'll see that the front wheel becomes disoccluded, but then also the center of the car becomes disoccluded. And so this becomes problematic because <coughs> our image reconstruction losses are trying to reconstruct the appearance of one image, um, <coughs> reconstruct the appearance of, of these images. And so all of a sudden they have situations where pixel or parts of the image are jumping, uh, they're appearing out of nowhere and other parts are disappearing. <coughs> and so this is exactly what I described there. So we have some uh, target frame that we're trying to train our network to be able to predict depth from. We're using supervision from maybe the frame next, next frame in the sequence or the previous one. And if we're using these losses to try and reconstruct them, we have a situation here where it's great because we can see the same location in the next time point. But here it's problematic because it's become occluded by the, by the stray. And so this is a, a really simple observation, but something that people were not doing was instead of trying to average those reconstructions across, uh, those uh, reconstructions across all the images in the sequence, we can instead just choose the ones that have the minimum uh, reprojection loss. Okay, this is another fun, fun case that we only kind of realized when we started looking into this. So we have the situation where, again, moving objects are problematic um, in the context of uh, these monocular videos, but there's a very special case of problematic moving objects, which is ones that are moving at the exact same rate as the camera. And so the problem is, or if you kind of were trying to th reason about this in the, in the world of disparity, basically these things are, are constantly at the same depth or they appear to be at the same depth all the time from the camera. So effectively, they can be really well explained by putting them away at, put, putting them at infinity, basically. And you see exactly that problem in, uh, in a lot of uh, recent work in the space. So again, these are the predictions. And if you look in the green circle, there's this big black hole where every time the model at training time has observed cars moving in front of it, they tend to be moving at the same rate. So it's, it's found this cheat or a nice way to explain that to say, oh, that car must be at infinity. Great, I'll move on and, uh, and worry about the next thing. Um, and because, again, you know, remember here crucially, this is a prediction from a single image. So it's just, it's kind of learned that relationship uh, from the training data. Okay, and again, the other simple observation we make on this is, well, instead of trying to fix this problem, let's just try and ignore those pixels altogether so we don't have to, uh, don't have to worry about them. And we'll hope that we'll see enough cars that, were, you know, that are static at other points in our training data that we won't have to, um, that we won't lose out too much. Um, yeah, and so we have basically a, uh, a mechanism by which we can uh, a, a dynamically ignore certain pixels and the way that they're getting ignored is if we can explain their motion by them not moving at all, we'll just use that as the, as the reconstruction for them. And the, the nice thing about this is that allows us to also work, uh, this also works quite well on scenes where the camera is static. So the explanation for this um, appearance change is that actually there's no motion whatsoever. <coughs> Okay, and then in doing that, when we train our model, we end up actually doing a much better job of predicting these types of uh, objects. Okay, the last one is, um, is related to architectural details of how you might train these models. So, again, I kind of alluded earlier on this notion that we have pretty conventional um, convolutional neural networks. We have some notion of an encoder, decoders, and then to help the training along, what we do, uh, what's commonly done, is we've got some notion of like multi-scale depth. So we'd like to predict low resolution depth and medium resolution, high resolution as intermediate signal so we can train these models. <coughs> The problem is, if you look at the top row, if we train with these low resolution, um, uh, if we have these low resolution intermediate representations of depth, we end up then trying to do reconstructions on really uh, low um, resolution input images. And as a result, it's, uh, you have these huge discontinuities basically in, in appearance space. Whereas the simple observation from our paper is that if we can actually just resize those low resolution um, depth maps. So we're still reasoning in this multi-scale, but we're resizing them up to the input scale. Now we have actually, um, we're able to do this kind of matching at the, uh, at the input pixel level, even though we're still utilizing the coarse defined nature of, um, of the depth maps. Okay, numbers I'll kind of skip over it, but the, the main message that a lot of this stuff when added together, so there's lots of different metrics we can use for um, evaluating the performance of these models because we have data sets that actually do have ground truth data. So the ground truth LIDAR data, so depth data associated with each image. And so this was one of the earlier methods I mentioned which doesn't have, um, which was using a monocular video, 
and uh, by adding all of our contributions we get a significant uh, performance uh, improvement and qualitatively I guess I kind of showed it earlier on you can really see the difference yeah and so really this maybe it's more imp important to see these things visually so the top is input um, video frames, and sorry, it's kind of compressed uh, in this presentation. And in the bottom, we have the predicted depth. So and again, these predictions are just made independently for each frame. Yeah, so I wanted to, like I said, I wanted to kind of spend some time uh, letting people realize where we're really at and what's, what doesn't work, I suppose. And so one thing that um, is a huge limitation in this space is that um, the kinds of, and it's, it's fundamentally problematic because we, we require data basically to parameterize and train these models, but we don't have access to good, very large, um, large and diverse benchmark data sets for, for this task. And so classically, this has been a big driver in a lot of advances in computer vision. It's been, you know, compute, it's been models, but it's also been data sets. Um, and so what we do have in this space is these kind of self-driving data sets. So this is great if you're interested in this particular um, uh, version of the problem, but not necessarily very useful if you want to generalize to, to arbitrary scenes. So these types of situations are great because we have <coughs> basically videos of cars driving around cities, we've got images, we've got uh, LiDAR depth and so on, but they have that limitation. We do have some indoor data sets that are available, but these are data sets that are um, widely adopted by the community but there are limited quality, so you can see there's kind of holes and so on in these, um, in these depth maps. Uh, they're also static scenes. They don't, again, feature the kind of dynamics and complexity <coughs> of the real world that we would like to, um, that we'd really like to deploy these models in. This is actually fun because this was harking back to some of the talks we saw earlier on in the day. So there's a data set called Depth in the Wild. I'm not sure if people have seen it. But the way that uh, Depth in the Wild has been collected, they've taken photos from Flickr or from the internet, and they've asked people to uh, look at pairs of points and estimate which point they think is closer to the, the camera. And so this is great because this is quite a scalable way of collecting um, quant large quantities of relative depth annotations. The problem is you only get that relative depth um, output, so you don't have any notion of like metric depth or anything like that. It's scalable, but it still obviously takes time and money to, to collect large quantities of these things. So again, not particularly uh, great as a benchmark. Other sources will kind of allude to multi-view <coughs> stereo or uh, stereo movies, for example. Again, potentially varied, but also lacking in ground truth, so making it difficult for us to evaluate the models. Yeah, generalization is really, for me, the, the real problem, I guess I'm, I always think about, like, how can we improve the quality of these models? So, um, and it's fundamentally linked to the data sets themselves, but here's an example where I've taken a Street View image from Google. So this is, I think it was in New York. And um, in this case, we have, uh, you know, a camera that's basically very different from the camera that we've used in the training set, very different, you know, focal length, intrinsics, and so on. So in some sense, great that this is doing something quite sensible, but this is still a self, you know, it's a driving scene. It's something that's not so different from the kind of driving scenarios that we've trained these models on. When we take it to, so this was a photo I took, uh, or I found on the, on the website for, for just outside here. Um, you know, you can see that you can take these models that have been trained uh, in these, um, again, in these driving contexts and apply them to these situations, and they don't particularly generalize very well. Do something slightly reasonable, maybe, but um, not actually particularly uh, good at the moment. And again, another example. So again, we just fundamentally have uh, scenes that are very different from what we've trained on. And you know, we don't necessarily expect miracles either in terms of generalization performance, but we certainly need to, to, to understand, is this fundamentally data set limitations or is this models that are memorizing, you know, training data, what's really happening? Um, yeah, moving objects are a real killer as well. So again, objects that have typically appeared to be moving during training time, like pedestrians, um, when we train with just monocular or just video sequences, we end up with these holes or, you know, infinite depth predictions. When we train with stereo, we don't have this problem because, again, the stereo view of the world is that everything is fundamentally static. Uh, and just wrapping up now, so another big issue is, is detail or thin structure. So it might be hard to see from the back, but we've got these kind of trees. Uh, and again, these models just don't do a particularly good job right now at capturing really the subtle detail of, of the world. Yeah, and uh, another issue is temp temporal stability. So again, we train these models to do predictions um, independently per frame. And so as a result, 
in some sense, it's great that they even are so consistent over time. But you do observe this kind of flickering effect just because there's no notion of um, temporal stability inherently built into it. <coughs> Yeah, so, you know, hopefully I've shown you, and I think you've seen as well, really well in the last two talks, that we can get quite far with modern, um, with modern computer vision in terms of these kind of uh, geometry prediction tasks. But there's definitely still a lot more, I think, that needs to be done. Um, yeah, for people that are interested, we do have um, code online, so you can literally just download the models, and in one line you can just put an image into it and, and make predictions out of it. Um, and you can also retrain on your own data sets as well. So happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? <laughs>